Okay, I, um, I'm. Yeah, thank you. So I'll just. Um, uh, what I'm going to show, I'm going to show some examples of my work, architectural work um, and ornamental work, uh, both uh, uh, mostly, mostly architectural. And then I'm going to show some uh, graphic uh, work, uh, both floral and geometric, and uh, end with some sevenfold patterns. Thank you very much. End with some sevenfold patterns and with some, uh, no, 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 I'm OK. I don't need that. Good. Thank you. So um, I want to first, uh, in response to uh, what was just being discussed, it's actually a great segue because it's what I was going to start by discussing in this talk anyway. So I restrained myself from speaking at the moment uh, until just now because uh, I also work with uh, digital manufacturing, but I also work with hand craftsmanship. And from my own experience uh, in this day and age, what I find to be especially uh, um, appropriate whenever possible is um, a, a, a blending of the two, much like what Reza was saying, where uh, uh, there's kind of a marriage between uh, digital and, uh, and hand craftsmanship. And whenever, uh, especially on larger projects where you could never really uh, conceivably uh, succeed in creating the work purely by hand. Uh, so it, it, in this case, at, at the um, Prophet's Mosque in Medina, a project I, I worked on some 25 years ago or so, uh, this, this project uh, was the ornamental aspects of this project, the, all these ribs were created, they're compound curves, so they're very complex curves. It's a, it's a semi-sphere, it's, a, it's, a not, it's not a half a sphere, but it's a portion of a sphere. And so these, these are not uh, great circles across the surface of the sphere, they're offset. So they're, they, they follow a, a, a kind of a complex curvature, a compound curve, and it's very difficult it's, uh, to uh, produce this. There are examples from historic architecture and Islam that do this. Uh, it's kind of amazing that they did it. It's very complicated. And these were done digitally. They were worked out on a computer, and then they were manufactured in Germany at one of the premier uh, wood milling uh, operations in Germany. Similarly, these are compound curves going around the base of the, of the dome. So, but all of the ornament was hand carved in Morocco. And, and there, are tw there are 27 of these domes, and they're over 20 meters um, diameter. And so, you know, the amount of carving Carving was significant, um, but to do it all by hand would have been very, very difficult indeed. So I'm a proponent of a marriage between the two. Uh, and then going to the work itself, um, yeah, I was brought in uh, to do this work uh, with a German firm uh, run by Dr. Bodo Rush. He works uh, at the time exclusively in Mecca and Medina. And he needed someone who uh, could work in the floral idiom. I've, this is all, all my work in this is floral. Well, OK, the, the, some of it's a semi-geometric. Semi um, this is a, another detail. There are 27 of these domes there. Are, you can see you know, it's a 16-sided star. Uh, and uh, each of these is multiplied by 16 and uh, 16. And then there are uh, eight of the base pieces. And so this, this took wood carvers in Morocco um, uh, we, they were working for over a year, and there were more than 100 of them. And uh, they, it was a lot of, an awful lot of work, requiring close uh, supervision on the part of uh, myself and some other quality control uh, people. And because it, it had to be just so, because it's for the Prophet's Mosque. The, these stones are uh, a stone called Amazonite. It's a beautiful turquoise color. The, they were just too large to be able to use real turquoise. You can't find turquoise in the, the kinds of quantities we needed. Uh, so yeah, the, the turquoise stones are all Amazonite. And you can sort of see a lot of gold. It's all gold leaf. The turquoise stones are um, uh, surrounded with gold-plated metal bezels. And the gold leaf, all of this gold or yellow color you see is all gold leaf. The, the whole project being that there are 27 of these domes, we used uh, several or a couple of kilos worth of gold, believe it or not. Ah, sorry. And there's a, there's a detail of some of the carving. And this is a pretty good likeness to the color of the stone. The carvers did a really superb job, but we did have to 
uh, we did have a pretty high waste ratio. We had to throw away quite a bit of what uh, arrived from. It was all uh, pre-assembled into gore segments of the dome, like a like an orange peel segment, uh, and. Those were then, uh, all of the ornaments, hand-carved ornaments, were applied to the maple, uh, curved maple veneer that we also made in Germany. And uh, those segments were then shipped to Arabia where they were installed in place. And that's a, a piece. The, the uh, objective, I said this on the first day, the, it, one of the comments, that the, um, the objective that I was uh, given when I was brought into this was to design a floral style that was Islamic, clearly Islamic, recognizably Islamic, but would not be identified with any one Muslim culture or period of time, so that it would be, uh, quote unquote, a pan-Islamic style. And um, since I des developed this 20 some odd years ago, uh, it's now been used a lot in other projects in uh, Mecca and Medina, and I understand that it's even been copied by some people in banks and places like that. So it's sort of been adopted. Uh, then uh, some years later uh, with the same firm I was asked to do the ornamentation for the mimbar for the uh, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. This is for the Kaaba. And this mimbar is portable. Uh, I don't have photographs of it but little wheels come down um, with an electric motor. It, they, it pushes it up so you can drive it. This is a door. The door opens and there's a little steering wheel. Yeah. And uh, a little seat. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and you can drive it. Uh, you can drive it uh, in and out of the Kaaba courtyard. And the reason is actually extremely brilliant. This is this replaces the original mimbar, or not original to the Kaaba, but the previous mimbar that had been there for centuries, which was Ottoman, and a large mimbar, very beautiful mimbar. Sadly, it had to be taken down because in modern times with the jet aircraft, so many uh, pilgrims are now coming to Mecca and Medina that uh, the uh, fixed original mimbar was becoming uh, an obstruction to circumambulation and was uh, in, in actually threatening to possibly result in people dying uh, because people get forced, they can't control the, the inertia of the movement. So, so they had a, a good idea under the circumstances of re removing the uh, old minbar and replacing it with one that could be removed during Hajj, during the pilgrimage season, it could be removed and then when Hajj is completed, then it can be uh, brought back. And so I, I did the, um, as another view, I did the ornamental features on this. You can't see in the two well. That's a little better, a little clearer, one of them. This is all marble. I personally, I think your mar marble here, uh, the Marmara uh, marble is so beautiful. They chose this marble from Macedonia because this is the whitest, the, the clients wanted a pure, pure white uh, marble because it represented purity to them. To me it looks like corian or plastic, but it's what they wanted. Um, this is, now these are real turquoise because it's smaller. So all of that's actual turquoise stones inlaid. May I ask something? Mm -hmm. um, this style is called a style. Sorry? Rumi style. Rumi style, Rumi yes. Style. Uh -huh. And so now uh, you can, I, want to, I wanted to show this because it gives an idea of the quality of the carving. These, all of this was carved um, in, uh, in uh, Rajasthan in India by Muslim, uh, a, a group of Muslim carvers that have been handing down their uh, skills from father to son, father to son for many, many, many generations. They're actually, they're actually members of the Chisti order of Sufism. And they are amongst the best marble carvers working in the world today, if not the best. And actually, they are of a quality that uh, is as good as anything from the past. They are absolutely exceptional carvers. So now this is just some quick graphics of the pieces from the mimbar. That's the obviously the side, side panel. It's got uh, a kind of pseudo reflective symmetry. This and this are the same, but the center has a double spiral. It breaks symmetry in this whole central region. And this is one of the side panels on the back. And it's, of course, a mirror axis. 
That's also, uh, that's a, a, on the balcony at the top, and that's of course a mirror axis. And this one's quite a nice symmetry. It's um, 180 degree rotational symmetry. As is this one, center being of course the center of the panel, it's 180 degrees, but I broke symmetry just at the very center to give it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more life. So these floral panels I do on the computer, yeah. But I, I work them out by hand first, uh, and I get what I want uh, by hand because the computer is not so good for that. Then when I know what I want, I, I go to the computer and I implement the design in the computer. And it's necessary for this for me because these then have to go to manufacturers and, and have to go to, uh, you know, uh, to be put into um, conceptual designs for the client to see, and, and it all has to be part of a, a larger uh, computer, uh, computer representation. So now jumping to, still in Mecca, but jumping to this clock tower. This, of course, is the Grand Mosque, and this is the Kaaba courtyard. Here's the Kaaba itself. And uh, some years back, uh, it was decided to build this huge complex of buildings in, in Mecca, right near the Kaaba. It's quite controversial. I think it's fair to say it's quite controversial. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it's the it's the largest uh, enclosed volume of architecture anywhere in the world. The largest used to be, I understand, the flower market in Holland. This has eclipsed that. Uh, and this is this tower itself is the uh, second tallest building. They purposely built it uh, two or three meters, only a small amount lower than the tower in uh, Dubai, so that it wouldn't be claimed to be the tallest building. They purposely wanted to keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, so my work was to, uh, they asked me to come in and do the clock face. Uh, so uh, I did not, I had no control over the, uh, uh, so the, the Saudi coat of arms, but I was asked to design all of these floral and subtle geometric patterns. And um, this was uh, all done in mosaic. This is huge. This is wider than a soccer field. This is, um, it's uh, approx approximately 40 meters. That's a little bit of a detail. How many meters is that? Inches? <laughs> I, it's really, I don't know, it's just, you, you can't throw a stone that far. It's really huge. Each of these little tesserae is a piece of gold leaf, uh, uh, 24 karat gold uh, tesserae's, uh, gold, gold leaf on glass, under glass to protect it. So each of these little pieces of a mosaic were laid by hand. So these are some details. And there's a, you, you can see there's a lot of sculpted relief. Part of the challenge wasn't just designing the floral pattern, but it's designing it so that it undulates, goes over, goes over and under, and has a sculpted side. Uh, we wanted it to be very proud. It stands from the base to the top about this high. And um, it's very proud so that it's more visible from far away. But on the hands, it's just flat. And I'm, that's, one of the, that's my design on the end of the minute hand. And I wanted to show it because of these little dots here. Those are uh, LED lights. And the whole clock face illuminates at night so that you can see it from very far away, uh, even at nighttime. So this is still in Mecca. This is a, this is a stairway, a ceremonial stairway that's used uh, once a year when the king enters the Kaaba to sweep the Kaaba so that he is, he's the caretaker of the holy sites and, and one of his um, ceremonial functions is to, as a caretaker, is to sweep out the Kaaba and he does this once a year. He, they used to use an airplane uh, stairway, you know, a, a tubular aluminum and they, wanted, they felt it was uh, uh, more appropriate for him to have something more splendid. And this was uh, designed again in Germany. I was brought in for all of the ornament. This, I don't have details of it. Now, um, my first project in Mecca was, uh, I think, about, well, going on 30 years ago. Uh, this was uh, one of the entry gates to the, to the city 
and um, modern entry gates. And I was brought in to ornament the inside of it. I had nothing to do with the outside or the design of it. But uh, I designed a series of domes in, in this particular style. We saw the same style when we went to the um, ceramic museum at the top copy. And that's looking down the rewalk to this the arcade of, of domes with this Persian-esque uh, uh, style that you see in Iran, Central Asia, you see it in India. It's called Rasmi. So now jumping to Lahore, this is also from the mid-1980s. Mid uh, this is a project for the uh, shrine of uh, a, a really great saint, uh, a Sufi saint in, in uh, in the uh, Indian subcontinent, Al Hujwari, uh, he's uh, he's responsible for he's thought to be responsible in large part of bringing Islam to the Indian subcontinent, and so he's greatly revered. Uh, and his his shrine is in Lahore. So many pilgrims go to this shrine that they sadly tore down the beautiful beautiful building that had been there to build a new building that would house more people. And uh, it's not a nice building, but um, but they asked me if I could do some work on the inside of it. Uh, this is for a, a Ofarkan Institute. It's just, this is actually the sample that I made with a, a friend and colleague in Pakistan, Rashid Bhatt, who's a wonderful calligrapher. And um, uh, he and I collaborated on doing uh, 22 linear meters of calligraphy and floral design. Uh, and it's a Jacobean manor house, so uh, there's a lot of acanthus patterns elsewhere in the building, so I wanted to keep with the acanthus pattern style. Uh, and this was carved in Pakistan, ca Pakistani Kashmir out of walnut with a nice, nice background, sort of three things going on with the floral. And then I also worked with Mukarnas, um, but um, not very many commercial projects with it. But this is one of them. Um, I designed this projecting bay off the uh, side of a high, high, uh, high building. So this is these are windows in three stories. Uh, and, but they didn't they didn't uh, interpret it very nicely. So I don't, I'm not going to show the actual photograph of the finished work because it's not very nice. Uh, that's, a, that's just a, a rendering of some of Mukarnas for a Mirhab. Then I, just for a lark, um, I designed a guitar uh, and, uh, that has a floral design. The wood on the face of the wood is from Atlas Cedar, from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. Uh, it's used on ouds in Morocco. Uh, it's a beautiful tone wood. But it's never been used on a guitar, and um, and we had leftover wood from the project in uh, the, the the domes that open and close that I first started by showing you. We had a lot of leftover wood, and I I uh, took some of that to America to a guitar maker and had this made. And then the neck I inlaid with the same floral style that was developed for uh, for that project in Medina. <clears throat> and then. Uh, that's another detail of the, it's a bit, uh, I play guitar, it's a little bit difficult to play because there's so much going on visually, but these, these uh, bright spots are um, markers that you traditionally have on a guitar. And uh, this was, we made two of them, one of them was a, a gift from my client's client to Cat Stevens, uh, Yusuf Islam, if you know him, yeah. So this is in London. And now uh, this is a piece of, of, of calligraphy and floral design. And uh, the, this was um, something I particularly like as a, an artist working in the floral idiom because it, the lettering, the calligraphy, constrains what you can do with the background. And, it, and the constraint is a, um, is a, is a wonderful, uh, is a wonderful uh, regulator on the design, it, and and it, it's uh, it's really uh, it's one of my favorite ways of working with floral design. This is this was a workup, a sample for the new expansion of the uh, Grand Mosque in Mecca that's currently underway. I've done a, a bunch of designs for that. This was not accepted because we had oh hundreds of meters of calligraphy, and literally hundreds of meters. And to do all of this hand carving, uh, it was not going to be uh, viable. And now this is a ceramic tile of mine that I made when I was a student at the Royal College of Art in London back in the early 1980s. And I'm also a glaze chemist, and so I, I worked on 
the uh, traditional high alkaline glazes of uh, Islamic cultures and they give this beautiful vivid turquoise uh, color and manganese purple and they're really great glazes. You can't replicate these colors with any other glaze chemistry. So you don't see these colors in modern, modern ceramics. You see turquoise, yes, but you don't see the same depth and richness of color that you get with the chemistry of, of uh, traditional glazes. This is just a little carving, a little sample to see uh, to see how some uh, a workshop, uh, how good a workshop was in Pakistan. It's a bronze, a cast bronze piece that was a, a sample for uh, some more work in Medina, but it wasn't used. Uh, this is some. Uh, this is a jolly screen carved in uh, in Rajasthan by the same carvers. This is uh, such meticulous work that they do. This is not my pattern, but it's a beautiful piece of carving. Twelve and nine pointed stars. And then I've also worked on uh, polyhedra. Now I'm getting into the geometric stuff. Uh, I've worked on putting patterns on polyhedra. Now this is what Reza was doing with you all yesterday. And um, these are some paper models that I made uh, 20 some odd years ago, 23 years, years ago or so. And then they ended up being made into a, a products that are still available now in Japan. Um, but it's really cool because uh, the, the, the geometry that happens on the two dimensional plane has certain characteristics, you know, tri triangle, square, hexagon, that, that cover the plane evenly. But when you go onto the sphere, whole new things happen. So in this case, this is a snub cube. In this case, uh, the vertices of the snub cube allow for the distribution, the even distribution on a sphere of 11-pointed stars. You can, you can use 12-pointed stars evenly on the two-dimensional plane. But isn't it interesting that on the sphere, you can put 11-pointed stars evenly? This is a great sort of uh, discovery. I, I, I really was happy to learn this. And it's very obvious. If you divide the uh, square into three, you have three. If you divide by the same angles of that division, the, the angle, the 60 degree angle of the triangle, you have two. So you have two, four, six, eight, plus three is 11. So it's, it's, very, it's very logical, but it's ornamentally, it's very beautiful. And this is a truncated dodecahedron, uh, which you can, uh, I have put uh, nine pointed stars in the center of the triangle and 10 pointed stars in the center of the pentagon. So you get nines and tens covering, uh, distributed beautifully across the sphere. And this is the whole set that you get. Now this, the colors, uh, I was asked to relinquish color control to a Japanese professor because these were for the Japanese market and they wanted a color palette that would be more acceptable or, or appealing, I should say, to a uh, Japanese aesthetic. Uh, and actually, I kind of like them. I, I, I wouldn't have gone with something like this personally, but it's, it's nice. I like it. And so you have five platonic solids and you have 13 Archimedean solids. So the, the, the complete set is uh, 18 polyhedra. And now, oh, that's a floral going backwards. Uh, that's my company logo, a little busy. Uh, but I like how it tessellates uh, together to make this design. It's, uh, it's, I'm happy with that design. Now I'm going to show you some patterns. They, they, there's, they're just graphic uh, patterns, but I wanted to show them because one of the things I like to do that we haven't really discussed at this conference very much uh, is, and that is, uh, more complex forms of patterning, like you find in Seljuk, Turkey, that have interesting combinations of localized symmetry. So these four patterns are all made from the same underlying um, polygonal structure or tessellation, and they have, as you see, eight and nine pointed stars. So it's eight and nine pointed stars uh, distributed across the plane. This is uh, another one. It's just a very graphic uh, piece, but it's 10 and 11 and 12 pointed stars. 12s are at the corner, 10 is at the center, and, uh, and uh, here as well. And uh, these are uh, 11s. And this is uh, 8s and 13s has an interesting repetitive device. It's kind of a shield shape. Uh, it's an octagon from here to here to here. This is coming in, coming back out. These are 90 degree angles. Each of the uh, eights is a 90 degree angle. It goes down and back up, in and back out. And the, the shields uh, rotate up 90 degrees to fit together snugly. 
Uh, yeah, so this is uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12 pointed stars. I won't identify which is which. I probably should have done, but these, these patterns really work nicely. What happens is that each of these is a regular star, uh, be it a 9, 10, 11, or 12, it's absolutely regular. There's, the, there's no uh, fudging in the uh, angles or uh, the uh, depth of the stars in order to make it work. Each is regular. Where, they, where the difference or where the problems are resolved is in this connective matrix. The connective matrix offers the opportunity to resolve the, um, the uh, problems, if you, you want to use that word. So now I'm going to just sort of quickly go through a step-by-step -step of making, I made this for this conference, this, I did this just the, before I left America, uh, because I wanted to do something new. Uh, those, are, those last ones I did years, I don't know how many years ago, they're old, old things. But uh, So this, I started, I want something 12 in the center, and then I've put six 13s around the 12. And so now I have my 13s, and I've wanted to put uh, 15s outside the 13s, keeping on the same line of radius. And I've determined this distance by this these two angles where they meet right here. Uh, that, that's determined the distance that I've placed my 15s. And by doing that, then I measure this angle. And uh, I'm able to identify that the 50.7 degrees is very close to 51.4 degrees of a 14 gone or 14-fold 14, uh, uh, division of the circle. So it's uh, close enough, it's less than one degree, it's close enough that I can place a 14 in there. Now we have it. And of course it's not quite uh, perfect, so the difference is, is uh, right where these little circles are. Uh, that, that's my little area of uh, fudge factor. Uh, but, but because uh, because uh, it's such a forgiving technique, you can't really see that angle in there. See, there's, there's an angle right there, but really it appears as a straight line, and it functions as a straight line when it comes time to make the underlying polygonal generative tessellation. So now I have this generative tessellation, and I can put my pattern lines in. I can put pattern lines in in, in, in any one of the four families that I was talking about the other day. In this case, <coughs> I'm using the acute family. I lay in my pattern lines at the midpoints or approximate midpoints, always the midpoints when it's the star. That way we get a regular star. It's, it's accurately a midpoint of each of these regular polygons, the large polygons. But then I, I, this, I determine where these lines, how they cross, where they go um, aesthetically. So this is a very hard thing to program on a computer because it's, it, to get this, these five-pointed stars and, and different shapes in here, to look right, you have to... Um, you have to weigh each uh, decision with its aesthetic merit, <clears throat> and then end up with something like this. This is kind of a typical Seljuk complex pattern. Um, and so now this is, a, this is a, 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 like that jolly screen. This is the same pattern with uh, nines and twelves. So this is a traditional pattern. And I'm just wanting to show quickly. So. The way you can make the radii matrix from which the network of polygons is created is uh, easily taking into 12-fold division, mirroring it, mirroring it again, or rotating it three times, whichever you prefer. And then you end up with this nice little radii matrix. <coughs> Or radii, yeah, radii matrix, and then three is in the center. Three, nine is divisible by three, so I know that I can put nine in the center. So here's the ninefold division in the center, and then with that, I can uh, draw a circle, and I can uh, take the uh, intersect where this, this, these two radii, put marks on it. Two, two lines perpendicular to the radii, and it, that, these identify the two sides of the uh, nonagon and the dodecagon, the nine-sided and 12-sided. And, and then you can sort of see these pentagons and, uh, and trapezoids, and sure enough, you end up with pentagons and trapezoids. So this is, a, this is the way I work. Uh, it's, it's the way that the top copy indicates they worked, um, but there's, no, uh, there's nowhere in the historic record a sort of a step-by-step -step description of how these uh, patterns were done. But this is a very logical way, and as I say, it conforms to the drawings in the top copy scroll. Um, and so, but what I wanted to show is that this one radii matrix of nines and twelves, yes, it makes this nice pattern, which has many historical examples throughout the Islamic world, but it will also make other... Um, it will also make other generative tessellations very elegantly uh, through another 
sequence of step-by-step -step procedure. You still have the nines and you still have the twelves and the finished result, but a different connective polygonal matrix, which creates a totally different pattern. Now, I'm not going to show you the patterns. Each of these will, each of these will create four patterns. So, here's another one. Another one from the same matrix, the radii matrix. Still another one. And these are all five of them that I've just shown. So you can see that from one radii matrix, you can get, in this case, five very acceptable polygonal tessellations, each of which will make at least four designs. So you know, suddenly we were getting 20 geometric patterns out of this one radii matrix. It's a very abundant technique. It, it lends itself. And then each of those 20 designs is open to stylistic variation and, and playing with the star form. So it becomes like a, a world in itself. So now to 14 and tw seven pointed stars. This is a design, this is my first design using 14 pointed stars that I did, oh, I don't know, 25 or more years ago, a long, long time ago. <laughs> and um, at the time, I didn't really realize that it was a system. Uh, I like this pattern very much. I didn't, I did not, I was not aware of any historical precedents for this kind of pattern, but there are a number. So as a system, there are basically the two regular polygons. There are elements that are derived through interstice uh, procedures where you tessellate with forms and other forms are left in the middle and you can use those as repetitive elements. There are others that are derived through truncation, truncating different portions of the seven gone and the 14 gone, the tetra tetradecagon and heptagon. There are others that are derived at through intersection and still others that are derived at by union. And the uh, beautiful um, the beautiful pattern that Grossan was showing us from the, uh, uh, the Friday Mosque in Isfahan made use of this element and this element. And the, um, sh and the patterns that I was showing in my first talk from Sildrick, Turkey, that have sevenfold characteristics are made from this element and this element. So these elements were used, but the extent to which craftspeople and designers uh, knew of these as a system at that early time or just knew portions of it, they obviously didn't know all of this, but, uh, and I'm not suggesting that they ever did. What I'm showing here is what uh, my friend Mark Palatier and I uh, have come up with as we've been working together in developing this as a system. So uh, you, there are kind of there are analogs between the sevenfold system and the fivefold system, and um, these are just uh, and these are showing um, showing the pattern lines in the four different families, and then these uh, the analogs become more interesting uh, in the secondary elements, and you can kind of see how they're uh, related to each other, and then similarly with the truncation and truncation elements in the two systems and intersection elements in the, in the four families. And uh, we've sort of been kind of methodical with this. Uh, and then uh, union elements. So now, uh, when you divide uh, the circle by 14, you can uh, come up quite easily, I think you'll, many of you already know, of course, with these three, uh, these three rhombi. Just like the tenfold division makes two rhombi that Penrose used, the sevenfold makes three uh, rhombi. And uh, you can, as Gusson was saying, you can easily or best identify these edges rather than as fractions uh, or of 360. It's easier just to identify them by the number of, of uh, portions of a 14-fold division. And so each of those can then have pattern elements added to it using all those pattern, uh, uh, those um, uh, uh, modular elements. And this is just one I made uh, for experimentation purposes. Each will work on its own to tessellate the plane. Uh, to, to repeat on its own. So you have all three of them and the pattern that it makes. Each will, uh, but you can also um, do a periodic um, uh, covering of the plane with all three of them. And you can see the, the repeat unit is that hexagon there. And then you can also take those three, and just like you can take the rhombi of the uh, uh, tenfold division, 
and um, do non-periodic uh, tessellations with them. So also with the sevenfold. So this has no, uh, no repetitive component. This is a aperiodic or non-periodic. Uh, the, the difference between non-periodic and aperiodic is, is a discussion that's interesting. We won't go into it. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand it. But um, I like this little, I colored them because I really like this undulating network of elements that goes around. And then also uh, it's kind of cool that uh, this, these systems, these, uh, these analogs uh, between the five and seven also can be seen to relate to other systematic um, components. So here you have uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, the, ninefold is, the ninefold also makes a system. Every time you jump in uh, a factor, once we, every time you jump a lot larger, more pieces get generated. So uh, the ninefold, like compared to the fivefold, the sevenfold has a huge number of pieces, but compared to the Sevenfold, the ninefold gets crazy. It's just like so many pieces, but it's still systematic. And here are some proportional relationships that happen. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, this work is taken from a paper that Mark and I co-published in Bridges in 2012. And the paper is available and is going to be available here at the Design Center. Reza is kindly making these uh, articles on Islamic uh, ornament that have been published by, in my case, yeah, a couple of times. But other people have published great articles uh, in Bridges as well. And uh, so there is a wealth of material and bridges. Uh, and this is from an article that, that I did last year and presented last year. So now these can work quite nicely to do quasi-crystalline structures. So this is a three-level structure. You have your tetradecagon. This, this is an analog, a tenfold analog. And then we're placing tetradecagons at the vertices connected by this uh, bow tie and coming down. And if you take this and shrink it down to here, if you take this whole thing and shrink it down to here, then you get the center. So this is a, uh, has a lovely uh, inflation uh, symmetry. It's very effective. And there's a detail of that area that Mark did. And uh, this is uh, showing the three levels. So the large green area here with the heavy line, that's the top level. Secondary level are these green shapes. I'm sorry, the blue shapes, uh, well, the green and blue, but you, yeah, you get the picture of these, these elements here. And the third level I haven't colored, I've just done it as line, line work. And you get these uh, really beautiful pattern line alignments where as a pattern line goes across, it, it intersects at key vertices on every level. All three levels are, are intersecting at key points. It's, it's fantastic what happens. It's just so beautiful. Uh, this is maybe not so clear. That's another dual level. No, nah, it's not worth it. Uh, and then the methodology that I use for producing these, uh, in which, again, in the I, it says historical. They, there's no historical sevenfolds. The methodology is what I was proposing is historical, not the design. So uh, I should have just taken that out for today. But the way I work and the way the top copy indicates, co top co copy scroll indicates, is that you take the you find first the distance that's closest together, that, that and you place your primary uh, polygons at that point so that they have a, a touching edge. And then that scale, you scale it down until it, you get to a point where the two are um, compatible with each other. The closest points are compatible. And you scale, that scale factor, then you repeat it and put it on, on all the vertices. And then from uh, all of this, this, then you put infill with other elements from the system. And that creates a nice even infill. And now we have these leftover areas. And um, I was really intrigued to see what Rima was doing because she had shown a much more uh, pro programmatic or systematic approach to this infill. I've done it, uh, I've done it uh, up till now by just experimenting. But, but clearly, uh, using scaling factors of what's outside to bring the same design on the inside would be a really nice way to, uh, to determine where the the uh, additional um, large scales go, large scale, uh, the, the, the primary uh, tetradecagons go. And then the pattern is this. And again, you have all of these very, very nice pattern line alignments. And so this is a 12-fold uh, self-similar design that I did many, many years ago. 
And you can, it's, I like this. I, I'm, I'm quite partial to the design. If you look at this 12-pointed star and these two uh, kites and this uh, hexagon, this irregular hexagon, and then with this three-fold element right here, this is a transition, you know, one, two, three, four. And then if you zoom down into this, you have the same transition, one, two, three, four. So it's got this inflation symmetry going on very effectively. Yeah, I'm almost done. I'll, I'll whip through these. These are on my website, so people can see them. So I'll just whip through them. This is one I particularly like. 20-pointed stars and 10-pointed stars. And it's uh, a broadened band uh, and emphasized with color. And uh, non-periodic. That's on my website, so we can skip it, as is this. This also has inflation symmetry. This is kind of interesting because it's, on the one hand, dual level. Uh, self-similar, but it's also completely non-periodic. So these centers of where the, the primary stars are, uh, they are not following any uh, systematic order whatsoever. They're, it's a non-periodic pattern, but it has inflation symmetry at the same time. And then lastly, I'm finishing with this interesting group of patterns that I've been working with that use a diminishing uh, underlying grid, uh, and uh, I won't go into the technicalities of it, but you can you can diminish infinitely. That's a pattern that is created from that diminishing grid. You can see how it gets smaller and smaller. And then you can also put inflation symmetry into that. So what's going on on the large lines, shrinking it down, is the same thing that's going on in the center. And the, the uh, inflation symmetry continues and I call these pseudo-hyperbolic because they get smaller and smaller to the outside. So they're sort of like some of the wonderful hyperbolic designs that have been done of late with geometric patterns, but it's not hyperbolic. And then putting pattern lines into this in the two-point family. And since that's a little bit rich, and I, by the way, uh, you know, those diffraction patterns that we've seen with the bright spots, it's sort of, there's a similar thing going on except for the fact that it's diminishing. So I'm, I'm sort of wondering if, they, if uh, they'll ever find a mineral that does something like this, probably not. And, uh, and then this is just a close up so you can a little better see what is happening there. This is not practical for use. I mean, how do you do this in Zillage Tile or even, you know, even with painting? I mean, how would you make this kind of detail? So this is really only, this is more of a stimulating mental exercise than it is a, 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 a practical uh, design for artwork. Thank you. Thank you.